It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 290, The Kingdom Parables Part 1, The Parable of the Sower. With this scene, we see Jesus enter into a phase two of his ministry with a greater focus on the teaching and the apostolic. It's almost like he's pastored his flock and he did an insane amount of evangelism in phase one. And now here he's released into an impartation stage where he takes his sheep and he releases them with deep teaching, even sending them out to do the miracles themselves. And while he previously demonstrated the kingdom, now he's teaching it. It starts here with the seven kingdom parables of Matthew 13. And this is the start of the parables. This is the start of this deep teaching phase. This is the start of the um, time for him to truly impart to his disciples. He's now discipling. While he was pastoring, it's like he's now discipling. He's, He's doing the apostolic thing where he's now training his future leaders. And we'll do a series of podcasts on the kingdom parables, just focusing on the first one today, the parable of the sower. Matthew 13, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was gathering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they weathered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. All right, fortunate for us, Jesus himself will interpret this parable for us. But in summary, a farmer scatters his seed in four places. And I mean, the the farmer is very liberal with the seed. He's just chucking it everywhere. It seems like the path, the rocks, the thorns, and the soil. And you can guess which one produces and sustains a crop. But there's a symbolism in tied other scriptures here that's pretty amazing. Now, Jesus thankfully gives his disciples the answer keys and the reason for the parables. It's to safeguard the scriptures, but to make everything deeper for the student and the disciple. Matthew 13, 10. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not hear. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and in turn, I would heal them. So it's super interesting. The parables are treasures for us and not for the unbelievers. It takes time and work to analyze and process and learn parables. It's treasure, so you can seek it out. But it's also written in a code, per se, to keep others out. And next, Jesus just slips in how blessed we are. I mean, Jesus fathom what he's about to say. Matthew 13, 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see, your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So, I mean, I pondered this one, like, that many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see. Even 1 Peter 1, 12 says this about angels. 1 Peter 1, 12, even the angels long to look carefully into these things. This is the thing of the righteous, a pondering thought. You know, you've done it before. Ever read anything about a great revival in Habakkuk 2, 
14. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. If you've ever read that, don't you kind of wonder how, when, <laughs> what would that look like, right? Ever pondered, when, O oh Lord, will you do this? This is that pondering. Or perhaps you've read Revelation and pondered when some of these things will happen. This is what Jesus is talking about, that is holy and righteous. It's holy and righteous to meditate and, and just ponder what God's prophetic words are and what they can mean. This is good. But even Jesus speaks to it. Don't let the future consume you, but in balance, ponder like Jesus said, but don't miss what's right in front of you. For Peter, James, and John, they had the front row seat to the fulfillment of the ages. Now Jesus interprets the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 18. You know, so now it's like, a, you know, imagine Nebuchadnezzar or Joseph you know, um, um, Daniel, um, Pharaoh, I kind, of, kind of twisted all those up. But um, all of those guys, they had a dream interpreted, right? They even had a dream, then they had an interpretation. Imagine a parable like a dream. Here's your parable. What does it mean, right? It's almost similar and symbolic in its nature and the way it, it is. Now, Jesus interprets the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short while. While trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed Falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. God is sowing everywhere, all the time. If you turn on the TV, there's a load of stuff. And there's Christian radio channels. There's always a Christian channel. There's a random evangelist everywhere, it seems like. There's churches on every corner. His conviction is present. You sin, you will feel conviction. His Holy Spirit is all around. It's true, moving from Seattle to Charlotte, North Carolina, the spiritual environment is different in different cities, but his presence and his conviction still is everywhere. God is sowing, and there's seed everywhere. Are we willing to receive it? And are we willing to do the hard work? Looking back on um, King Saul versus King David, Saul was like the seed and the thorns. Even though it says God gave him a new heart, he did. But the worries and fears and man, specifically in this case, the fear of man, choked out the word, making it unfruitful. But David, though rejected by his family, he encountered God in the wilderness and worshiped God and developed a strong foundation. And when the anointing came, it never left him. Perhaps for a small bit, but not for long. Because he had a strong foundation. This is so important for the parents out there to get it right. To establish a loving and caring, inviting home to raise your kids with the fear of the Lord and the worship of God. This is the strongest of foundations. For when the winds of the Spirit come... And more sowing comes into their life, God will do wonders, and your modest tilling of the soil will lead to multiplication in their lives. It's those boring seasons of tilling and hard work on our hearts. Often the valley seasons, the quiet seasons, the times when things don't seem to be prosperous are when God is tilling the soil of our heart to make sure we're ready to host his glory in our lives. Think of Moses. He spent 40 years with a sheep before the burning bush. This season of nothingness was his tilling season, when his heart was prepared for greater things. God's ways are different than man's ways, and you can see it all throughout the Bible. Joseph went from a prisoner to prime minister, all the while learning Christ's character as a slave. Daniel learned, most likely as a eunuch in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, only to become chief advisor and potentially ruler of the Babylonian Empire when the king became a wild beast for a short while. I have no doubt there are a thousand Josephs and Daniel out there waiting for their moment for the king to say, interpret my dream. 
He did it then, and he'll do it again today. And this is my pondering. This is me wondering when he will do it again for the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. Let's conclude this episode. Um, if you see the artwork from this episode, you can see someone's rendering of sewing. And it's easy to, easier to understand this parable by looking at the artwork. But let's go a bit deeper. I think the parallels are super interesting. There was seed sown by God in four places. The path, the rocks, the thorns, the soil. The path is a person with no understanding. And the seed doesn't take root. The rocks um, is a, one who falls away from trouble or persecution, due to trouble or persecution. The thorns, uh, worries of life, deceitfulness of wealth and riches, uh, I, I could fit in that category, fear, anxiety, worry, that, those are the thorns. And the fourth is the good soil. God is very liberal in his sowing of seed. He seems to not mind lost seed, for we'll learn it only takes one seed to grow a monstrous tree. Seed was sown in four places, one good, three bad. The three bad are the rocks that thorns the path. The seed is lost in these cases due to the lack of understanding, trouble or persecution, and the worries of life. This sounds a lot like 1 John 2.16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. According to this verse, the world, the life of sin, rests in three categories. The lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. In summary, the lust of the flesh is sin and temptation. The lust of the eyes is fear, anxiety, worries. This is when Peter's walking on water and he looks and he sees the wind and the waves, right? Um, this is when he falls away. His eyes are on the wrong thing. And the pride of life is simply stated as, you want to just put it in these words, pride, one word, pride, the sin of the devil. I can become God. I know better. Isn't that true? The prideful lack understanding because they refuse to learn. All right, so here is the seed. If it lands on good soil, it's set. But if it lands on the rocks, there is temptation, or among the rocks, there is temptation of the world, and they can fall away. If it lands on the thorns, they're near the thorns, the fears of life, the fear, anxiety, worries of life, choke it out. If it lands on the path, there is no root, there's no understanding. It is like pride, lacks understanding, and they refuse to learn. So what does this mean? It means everything to me. If I was to imagine my heart like a field, or my soul as a field, I want it to bring the greatest heavenly fruit in my life. I want my heart, my mind, my soul to be the utmost kingdom soil. So when it comes to the world, I want nothing of it. We are to live in the world, but we're not to be of this world. I want to clear my heart, the field of my heart with any rocks or thorns of the pride of life. When it comes to temptation, we do the Joseph. <laughs> when it comes to temptation, Joseph was our model. He ran. When it comes to fear, anxiety, and worry, we must live a life of surrender and forgiveness. And this is a daily thing, right? And when it comes to pride, our lifestyle and actions must be humble and Christ-like. And this is how we're to live this life. And this is how we, to, we are to bear great fruit. Expand your field. It says, expand your tent pegs. Expand your fields. Expand the fields of your heart to remove those rocks. Remove those thorns. Even the path. Create good soil. Put good soil there so that every time God sows and every, every time there is a seed from heaven that comes into your life and your family, may it become a harvest. Make your heart, your soul, your life, the greatest of souls, <laughs> greatest of soils, prepared to bear the greatest fruit for the kingdom. 
And I pray this over myself and the listeners out there, that God himself does whatever he needs to do to prepare us to bring forth the greatest harvest of righteousness that he can in our lives. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Check out the website, messagetokings.com. Feel free to connect with us at messagetokings at gmail.com.